and pass the bill we have sent them days ago that would allow this government to reopen and allow the leaders of this chamber and the other chamber to move forward on dealing with the real issues facing our country. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Majority Leader. Republicans understand why the government is shut down. But now they are focusing on trying to cherry pick some of the few parts of government that they like. They don't like it all, but they like a few parts of it. It's just another wacky idea from the Tea Party driven Republicans. You can tell that the Tea Party Republicans still want to keep the government shut down. If they wanted to reopen the government, they would simply reopen the government by bringing the Senate's bill to their floor, let it pass with a majority vote. We could reopen the government in a matter of minutes. If Speaker Boehner had the courage to stand up to the Tea Party, I said the word we, they. Now, we support veterans and parks. We support the FBI. We support veterans. We support the federal government. That's our job. That's what we do. But, Mr. President, we can't and we won't be forced to choose between parks and cancer research or disease control or highway safety or the FBI or, as we've heard here today, on and on with examples of our national security agencies cut by more than 70 percent of their personnel. They are seem, the Republicans seem willing to fund veterans, but what about the rest of the government? First, we need to end the government shutdown, and then Democrats are happy to agree on funding specific items. We're glad to do that. We're happy to agree to funding priorities as soon as Congress enacts legislation to reopen the government. The Republicans' plan is not a serious plan. It's not a plan to run the country. It's not a plan that the American people sent us here to do. Mr. President, this is just as clear as the presiding officer I know, see before me. Wide-shouldered, former governor of West Virginia, someone that has been in government for many, many decades. It's so clear. Here's what it's all about. And they have it in words. Here's their plan. And they, some of the... Uh, Rabble-rousers over here have said what they want to do is uh, take little bits and pieces of the federal government, send something over to veterans today, parks tomorrow, maybe security agencies tomorrow, and the next day, and this will go on for weeks, but what won't get funded? Obamacare. Now, Mr. President, it's so obvious. In fact, one of the senators said this. <clears throat> In fact, I'm paraphrasing part of this. This has appeared in the Salt Lake Tribune. Um, we can't, it's obvious we can't end Obamacare, but we're going to have a different approach. In, in light of the fact they can't end Obamacare, here's what the quote is. In light of that, let's leave Obamacare for another day and not hold hostage the vast majority of government functions. He said, you, the Utah Republican has claimed credit for kickstarting the effort to use the federal budget as leverage to halt funding for Obamacare, a move that led to the impasse of the government shutdown. So they couldn't do that. So now what they want to do is nitpick these little things while the government is shut down and wait until the end and there's nothing for Obamacare, in spite of the fact that millions of people now have health care today that they didn't have yesterday because of the changes coming online. We need to reopen the government, and the key to that still remains over in the House of Representatives. It's a Senate-passed, clean bill for the whole government. If Republicans were serious, they would pass that bill. Does anything, it, they're doing anything else is just sour grapes. Madam, Mr. President, this is not serious. The government is shut down. And if they think they're going to come and nitpick us on this, it won't work. It won't work. Senator from New York. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Well, the latest Republican proposal is a cynical one that pits important priorities against each other. People shouldn't have to choose between help for our veterans and cancer research. We shouldn't have to choose between keeping our highway projects going and cleaning up toxic waste areas. And we shouldn't have to choose between visiting our national parks and enrolling our kids in Head Start. As we said a thousand times, we are happy to discuss how to fund the government, but not with a gun to our heads. Open up all of the government, and then we can have a fruitful discussion. And you know, Mr. President, it gets a little tiresome. It's game after game, gambit after gambit, from the other side of the aisle. They keep trying new things, new tricks. Some of them have to do with Obamacare. Some of them are unrelated to Obamacare. They're trying as they might, Speaker Boehner, to wriggle out. Speaker Boehner is trying to wriggle out of the box in which he's put himself. On the one hand, he knows shutting down the government is highly unpopular and hurts America. On the other, he is so used to giving obeisance to the hard right that he's afraid not to. He's betwixt and between. But I'll tell you, Mr. President, today was a bad day for Speaker Boehner and those who want to shut the government down. The polling data is overwhelming. Americans, three to one, support opening the government, even if it means keeping Obamacare going. Americans think that the Republican Party is being irresponsible and not living up to what it should be doing. Americans are telling Republicans in the House, vote now. Put, open the government by putting a clean, continuing resolution funding bill on the floor. And they'll have new games. But we're not going to go for them. Sooner or later, they're going to have to say, okay, we'll fund the government. And then we'll discuss things. But as has been said over and over again, not, not with a gun to our heads. Democratic unity is strong as ever. From 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue to just about every member of the House of Representatives to all 54 members of this United Democratic Caucus, Mr. President. And that is a great thing because it means that there's hope. The bad news about today is, of course, that many innocent people were hurt. 800,000 federal workers who depend on paychecks to feed their families are told they can't come into work. They're dedicated to their jobs. They want to come in and work. They can't. And of course, they're not getting paid. Millions more are affected as well. We had furloughs at the Niagara Air Force Base in Buffalo. Defense employees, many of them civilian. We fought hard to keep that base open. And now we're telling the people, go home, you can't work today, as important as that base is to the security of America. Senator Feinstein was here earlier. Three quarters of our intelligence people at the NSA are not working. You know, now that's an abstract concept, but it relates to every single one of us in our security. The idea of shutting this government down may sound good to the hard right in the abstract, but even when their constituents learn of what specifically it means, they're going to run away from that concept. And so, to my colleague, particularly from Texas, this junior senator from Texas, who's evidently come up with this new plan, face it. You are not going to get us to give in to extortion. You are not going to take as hostage millions of innocent Americans and succeed in getting us to do something you want, but we don't and they don't. And one other thing I would say, Mr. President, and I saw in the Salt Lake City paper, 
the senator, the junior senator from Utah, said maybe we should forget about Obamacare and look to spending cuts. Well, good morning. That's what we've been saying all along. We may not like the spending cuts in certain areas that they propose, but we're willing to discuss them. That's how the budget works. That's how appropriations works. That's how our government is run. But to take an extraneous issue and say, unless you get rid of it, we're going to shut down the government, no way. And let me tell my colleagues, if they think they're having a rough time here on shutting down, on shutting down the government in terms of the politics, in terms of where people are, in terms of their base of support, wait till they try to shut down the debt ceiling. Senator Cruz, Senator Lee, it's going to be ten times worse. The dangers are even greater to America. The pressure on all of us will be even more severe, and that won't work either. So I have a simple suggestion. Let's, in one fell swoop, fund the government, allow the government to pay its bills, and begin debating the spending issues that we should justly debate instead of putting America through these paroxysms. Because you know, we know, and the American people know, you will not succeed. I yield the floor. Senator from Illinois. Mr. President, we were uh, notified uh, just after lunch of the uh, new strategy that's coming out of uh, the cruise control that uh, we're facing on Capitol Hill. It turns out that Senator Cruz is going to pick and choose those department that's, departments of government that he wants to open. That's right. The junior senator from Texas, we're going to go through his priority list of federal agencies that he thinks should be opened and funded. We closed down virtually all of them at midnight, and sadly, some 800,000 federal workers have been furloughed across the United States some of them going home without a paycheck for as long as this goes on. And now, the height of irresponsibility is that the junior senator from Texas now wants to pick and choose those agencies he wants to reopen. So one of those agencies, not surprisingly, is the Department of Veterans Administration. Well, of course, we owe that obligation to our veterans. And so they want to open the Department of Veterans Administration, but uh, maybe not other departments. Let me remind the senator from Texas of a couple realities. They may fund the Veterans Affairs Department with a short-term appropriations bill, but this bill won't help bring back the paychecks of the 546,000 veterans who currently work for the federal government. 546,000, over half a million. So to help the Veterans Administration, they're ignoring a half a million or more veterans who are federal workers. More than one in four federal workers is a veteran. And more than a quarter of veterans employed by the federal government are disabled. So the senator from Texas is picking and choosing those veterans he wants to help. The disabled veterans working for our federal government are not going to get the help. Those working at the Veterans Affairs Department will. That is the height of irresponsibility. It is the height of arrogance. And then, of course, he decides, since he's heard enough speeches about all the national parks that are going to be closed, we're going to open the national parks. Well, that's a good thing. I would support that. But let me ask the senator from Texas, who's now deciding what's important in our federal government, do you think maybe the medical research at the National Institutes of Health is important? You think maybe the efforts that these scientists and doctors are undertaking to find cures for diseases, the next drug, the next medical device, the next surgical technique to save your life or the life of someone you love is important? You bet it is. The list goes on and on. It is reckless for this senator from Texas to decide, well, okay, tomorrow veterans and national parks, and maybe later on we'll get around to medical research, or maybe we'll get around to criminal administration in the Department of Justice. Maybe we'll get around to bringing the people back to the intelligence agencies 
who are monitoring terrorists all over the world who threaten the United States. So I sure hope we make the wish list of Senator Cruz when it comes to our national security to think that this senator has the nerve to try to decide what's really, really important for America. I'll tell you what's important for America. It's important to end this irresponsibility and this recklessness. It's important for us to realize these are real lives and real people doing real work for the United States of America. Using them as political pawns is an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment to this institution and those who are pushing this agenda. We know this problem can be cured and solved in a matter of moments. Speaker John Boehner have the nerve to put on the floor of the U.S. House of Representatives the spending bill that passed the Senate. It would pass in a minute, and you know it. And that's why he won't call it. Would the Senator yield for question? Be happy to yield. Through the chair, I say to my friend from Illinois, during all this prioritization that they're doing, this agency, that agency, the government's closed, isn't it? Senator the government from, is closed. Senator from Nevada is correct. As of midnight, the notice went out that the governmental agencies were closed. There are some that are doing important jobs that are absolutely essential, but, you know, air traffic control, for example. But the agencies of government have been closed. You should listen to Senator Mikulski from Maryland. I wish Senator Cruz could come to the floor and just pay a few minutes listening to her about the National Institutes of Health and the Centers for Disease Control, which this reckless strategy by the Republicans have closed today, really. Closing the doors on medical research in the United States of America. What a moment of great pride for the Tea Party to be able to claim they closed down the National Institutes of Health. And now they're going to pick and choose. Maybe it'll make the list perhaps not this week, but next week. We'll get back into the business of medical research. On the greatest nation on earth, we are facing this. And it not only makes the United States look bad around the world, it harms our economy. Think about it for a moment. How much confidence would you have in the United States of America if its government is capable of shutting down over a political squabble that is totally unnecessary? shutting down the government of the United States of America. What a source of pride for the Tea Party Republicans, but not for the rest of America. The rest of America knows that we need to roll up our sleeves and solve our problems. We've got to stop these doomsday scenarios, these threats, this irresponsible, reckless strategy from the Tea Party Republicans. It's time for the Speaker of the House of Representatives to not just lead the Republicans in the House, but to be a leader for America. It's time for all of us to come together and fund this government and move it forward today. Not tomorrow, not next week, not beyond. And more. When it comes to the debt ceiling, it's the full faith and credit of the United States at stake. The question is very basic. Will America pay its bills? These same members of Congress who voted for the spending now refuse to pay the bills. Oh as Senator, or Congressman Obie of Wisconsin used to say, they want to pose for holy pictures. Oh yeah, we voted for the spending, but we don't want to pay for it. We're not going to vote for a debt ceiling, my goodness. The word debt scares us, and it may scare the voters. So they would see the United States default for the very first time in our history on our debts, fail to make payment on our debts. What's the practical impact of that? What happens if families decide not to pay their debts? You know. Skip a mortgage payment. You're going to get to meet your banker. They're going to call and say, uh, pardon me, Senator, did you notice that you didn't make your mortgage payment? And if you didn't notice, we did, and it's going on your credit report. The next time you try to borrow money, it's going to be at a higher interest rate because you're not very credit worthy. Now multiply that into a nation of more than 300 million people. The next time we start to borrow money after we've defaulted on our debt for the first time in history, What's going to happen to America's credit rating? Interest rates go up. Well, so what? A slight tick up in the interest rate paid by America for its debt consumes billions of dollars that can be spent on education, on research, on building America's infrastructure. Wasted money because of this wasteful political strategy from the Tea Party Republicans. 
Over and over again, Speaker Boehner has sent us these bills to defund Obamacare. Why were they so desperate to stop health care reform? Well, because October 1st, today is a big, big day across America. For the very first time, we are providing Internet access to uninsured Americans so that they can see, maybe for the first time in their lives, a chance to buy health insurance. Some of them have never, ever been protected by health insurance. Now, they may have a chance. Affordable health insurance. In the state of Illinois, 1.8 million uninsured people get a chance. A chance to buy health insurance that they can afford. I heard at lunch today that more than 2 million people visited this website in the state of New York this morning. 2 million. Think there's a pent-up demand here for health insurance? And it also is an indication why the Tea Party Republicans are in a fevered state over this Obamacare coming online, because it's going to work. It's going to finally give peace of mind and health insurance protection to people who have lived a lifetime without it. I've met them, folks who've got a child with diabetes, a child with a mental illness, a child with asthma. That's pretty common, you know, Mr. President. People who can't get health insurance because some member of their family has a pre-existing condition. Well, Obamacare finally wipes that off the slate and says you can't discriminate against people because of pre-existing conditions. Well, you listen to Senator Cruz and others, and they say, we want to do away with that. We want to do away with that protection. I hope the senator never has to face that in his own family. Some of us have. And once you've faced it, you realize what a heartbreak it is not to be able to buy health insurance because of a pre-existing condition of someone you love in your family. We're going to change that with Obamacare. We're going to give people a chance to buy health insurance. And that's what frightens these Republicans. The notion that as that program takes root and grows in America and people have the confidence and peace of mind of health insurance protection, it's going to be a program they cannot wipe away with the back of their hand. So all of the things that we're seeing, the political gymnastics that are coming from Senator Cruz and the Tea Party Republicans notwithstanding, we know the bottom line is this. This is a good, strong nation where Democrats and Republicans need to work together to solve our problems together. Not with threats, not with guns to our head, but in a common purpose of serving this great nation. I'm troubled that now we're going to get the Senator Cruz list of his favorite agencies. He starts with the Veterans Administration. Let him start with the federal workforce, where over 500,000 members are actual veterans and a quarter of them disabled. If he really cares about veterans, have him call the Speaker. Let's get this government up and running again tomorrow. We can reflect on what happened during the last 24 hours if we do. But let's not continue this embarrassment to the United States. It is irresponsible. It is reckless. It is damaging to our economy and a lot of innocent people. We need to put it into this government shutdown. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Mississippi. Mr. President, I regret also that we are now experiencing a partial shutdown of our federal government. Through no fault of their own, some citizens who are visiting Washington are also being denied government services and access to memorials that their tax dollars support. I hope we can soon eliminate any inconvenience that's being caused by this shutdown for the visitors and the citizens who've planned trips into our nation's capital. The effects of the shutdown are real, and they've been felt in practical ways uh, well beyond the nation's capital, too, but certainly here in Washington. We have witnessed an example of the unintended and sometimes absurd consequences of the Congress and the President's ability to reach an agreement. Today, for example, a large group of World War II veterans from my state of Mississippi caught an early flight from Gulfport to Washington as part of the Honor Flight Program. These flights allow veterans who might not have the ability to come here on their own to visit 
the National World War II Memorial that was built to honor their brave service. Service that saved the world from some of the greatest evils ever known. Confronted with barricades, however, that were erected this morning around the open air memorial as a part of the shutting down of the federal government, the citizens from my state carefully removed the barriers and made a path so they were able to walk onto the, to the uh, memorial and lay a wreath beneath the memorial's Mississippi column. I'm very pleased that the visit of these veterans to Washington was not ruined by the government shutdown, even though there were some obstacles. But I hope their experience reminds all of us, federal agencies, members of Congress, others who live here in the nation's capital, to not make this situation more difficult than it has to be for veterans or other visitors who are coming to the city, some for maybe the only time in their life they will be able to do that. So I take this opportunity to thank the veterans from our state for their calm, cool, and collected demeanor during what could have been a frustrating experience. And I salute all veterans for their service to our nation and the access that they have even on a day where the agencies are, quote, closed, end quote, that there are certain premises that should remain open and are available for visitation and visibility of those who come to visit our nation's capital. I thank the Honor Flight volunteers for their calm, cool, and collected demeanor and their support for the freedoms of our country. I'm sure they will all receive a very warm welcome tonight when they return home to Gulfport. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, let me thank the uh, distinguished senator from Mississippi for his remarks about these uh, honor flight veterans. We just had a group come down from Rhode Island, including one gentleman who was 100 years old. And uh, it was so meaningful for them. And uh, in Rhode Island, it's particularly the fire chiefs and the firefighters who have been helping to organize these honor flights. And uh, Chief George Farrell and others, I think, took immense pleasure and meaning out of having brought these gentlemen down and enabled them to have this recognition. The tide of time is sweeping that greatest generation into its dying years. And while they are still among us, it is a wonderful thing to do. So I thank the Senator from Mississippi for that. Now, I came to the floor to, um, I guess, welcome to Tea Party shutdown day one. I do not know how long this is going to go, but uh, it is already having a, I'll say, miserable impact in Rhode Island. We have as many as 7,000 federal employees facing furlough. Uh, we just got word that at Naval Station Newport, 800 men and women have just been furloughed. Uh, our Rhode Island National Guard just let us know that they're anticipating 300 furloughs. These are people who work hard for our federal government. They do important jobs, uh, particularly with respect to the National Guard and Naval Station Newport for our troops. And it is not fair to them that the Tea Party extreme over in the House would insist on putting them out of work in order to try to force basically a way around the constitutional process of government here in Congress. The 
key to putting those 7,000 Rhode Islanders, the 800 Naval Station Newport, the 300 guardsmen, uh, civilian employees, back on the job is a very simple one, and it is in the hands of Speaker Boehner. All he has to do is call up the continuing resolution. All he has to do is take the measure that the Senate passed and put it before the House for a vote. Just give it a vote. That's all it takes. Why does he not do that? He doesn't do that because there is this peculiarity over in the House called the Hastert rule. It's not a real rule. It's just called that. It's a practice. It's a practice that's named after a former Republican speaker, Speaker Hastert. And the practice is that if your own caucus won't agree on a bill, if the Republicans all by themselves in a room with no Democrats present won't agree on a bill, then the Speaker won't even give Democrats a chance to vote on it. It will never come to the floor. It is the most partisan rule or practice that exists in this body, in my estimation, in Congress. And it has been a problem for the Republicans before. There have been times when Speaker Boehner has had to use that key that he has to simply put a measure before the body without it clearing that partisan pre-screening by his Republicans. And he's done it over and over again to protect the Republican Party from itself. When they were going to force choices that would be terrible for the country, terrible for the party ultimately, the first was on the fiscal cliff. You remember the Harris breadth antics that led up to the fiscal cliff? Well, finally, Speaker Boehner put the fiscal cliff bill to a vote in the House and it passed. Two to one, the Republicans voted against it in the House, so we know that it flunked the Hastert rule test, but it passed the House with a bipartisan vote of Republicans and Democrats, and it spared us then going off the fiscal cliff. That was the right call for the Speaker to make. It was the right call for the country. It was the right call for his party because they didn't want to own that debacle, and he made a good decision at that time. The next was the Violence Against Women Act. Over and over again, we've passed the Violence Against Women Act in bipartisan fashion in the Senate, and it's been passed in bipartisan fashion over there in the House. Well, we passed it again in bipartisan fashion in the Senate, and it was going to fail in the House. Well, how do you go back to your voters if you're a reasonable House member and say, well, we refused for the first time to pass the Violence Against Women Act? It came over in bipartisan fashion from the Senate. It had strong support here, but we refused to pass it. Well, they couldn't. So once again, Speaker Boehner waived this so-called Hastert rule, this practice of having to have his caucus have a pre-veto on anything that comes to the floor, and he brought the Violence Against Women Act to the floor, and once again it passed. It passed with Democrat and Republican support. The third was the disaster bill for Sandy. Many of our states were hit darn hard by Sandy. New York and New Jersey took really crushing blows. But the House Republicans didn't want to fund this particular disaster recovery. In fact, they voted three to one against it. Three to one against disaster recovery for their fellow Americans. That's how they voted over there. But Speaker Boehner knew how much trouble he'd be in with, among others, Governor Christie of New Jersey. So he called it up anyway. He violated this so-called Hastert rule, and he brought it up for a vote, and it passed again in bipartisan fashion. Today, tonight, tomorrow, the next day, any time he chooses, Speaker Boehner can turn the key and unlock the government Tea Party shutdown. He can do that. He's done it three times before. Of course, that got all his Tea Party folks all excited, and they started making new threats and new challenges and new demands. So he's reluctant to go down that road again, but he has done it before, and it remains in his hand. And I would submit that it is the right thing to do for our country and that he should put that first. The first way that they fouled up 
the continuing resolution was to try to stall the Affordable Care Act on it. Well, we voted that down over and over again, and cooler heads may be beginning to prevail, but I'd remind everybody that there are two pretty distinct, I guess we'll call them Obamacare's now, since that's the word that's being used, two Obamacare's out there. One, to use Majority Leader Reid's phrase, one is a punchline. It's the punchline Obamacare that rep sends that right-wing email chain into vibrations, but it's mostly a product of fertile and overheated imagination. The real Obamacare, at least the real one that we see in my home state of Rhode Island, is actually something that we like a lot in Rhode Island. Seniors that are getting protection from the dreaded donut hole and are saving over $1,000 each on prescription medications on average, they see the Affordable Care Act as something that is making a real benefit in their lives right now. Parents like myself who have kids out of college and under 26, I hear this from everybody across Rhode Island. Thank gosh that the Affordable Care Act is there because my daughter is out of college and she hasn't been able to find a job yet that has a health care benefit. So I can keep her on my policy and I don't have to worry that if she gets sick, the whole family could be bust. Having her on my policy makes me feel so good. Thank you for that. That's what I hear. That's a real and good thing for actual Rhode Islanders. It's not the imaginary Obamacare, it's the real Obamacare. Families that have a child with a pre-existing condition. Now what do you do about that? You could spend down and give up all your resources, everything you've worked for and earned, so that your family can go on to Medicaid. That's one way. Or you could stay in that same job forever because the minute you try to move from your employer's health care plan to a new employer's health care plan, your child's pre-existing condition doesn't get covered any longer. So you're trapped. Across this country, people were spared that agony by the Affordable Care Act. And we had Peter Orzag in the other day to talk to our caucus. He said that Medicare prices, in the, if you extend out the cost of Medicare to the future, it's already down $1.2 trillion from the savings that we see from reforms that are happening in red states, in blue states, in Massachusetts, where the presiding officer is from, in Utah, in Pennsylvania, in Wisconsin, in Minnesota, in California, in Rhode Island, all across the country. Doesn't matter, it's not political, it's about a better health care system, and we're already seeing the savings. That's what they want to take away. That's what they want to stop. Thousand bucks out of the pockets of seniors back to the pharmaceutical companies, that's what the result would be. Parents having to lose the protection for their kids, 26. Family still trapped with a child with a pre-existing condition, never able to leave the company they work for. And the savings beginning to evaporate that we're already seeing. Why do you shut down the country to harm people in those ways? It makes no sense. The Tea Party shutdown has got to stop. I ordinarily come to the floor at this time to discuss the appalling way that the Senate and the House are just blissfully ignoring all the evidence all around us of what carbon pollution is doing to our atmosphere and oceans. And there is a clear connection between the problems that we're in today that have caused this Tea Party government shutdown and our inability to face the facts about carbon pollution as a Congress. And there are some similar characteristics between those two problems, and I would like to discuss them briefly. 
One characteristic is an inability to face and address present or looming problems, real ones. In the case of the Tea Party shutdown, they've actually created a massive artificial problem, a government shutdown for our country, at the same time that they prevent us, the Tea Party members prevent us from getting together to take the Senate budget and the House budget and bring them into conference and try to work out agreement in the ordinary process like adults. And it's all in the service of the pretense that I just discussed that the Affordable Care Act isn't actually good for our country. It's a triple phony problem whammy for our country. This inability to face and address real problems, that's the first characteristic. The second characteristic is that inability is based on opposition that stands on false or fanciful arguments that is based more on propaganda than facts. In the case of climate, the fanciful argument, the falsehood, is that the jury is still out and that the evidence isn't not only real but overwhelming right now. And the third characteristic is that the opportunity to face and address real problems is fomented by small interest groups wishing to exercise undue influence without due regard for the harm that they cause to their fellow Americans. That's our DC trifecta these days. We can't deal with real problems. We have an atmosphere of phony arguments and propaganda that foul things up. And it's based on opposition that is driven by small but powerful special interests. So I hope and pray that the American people will send a strong message to the Tea Party to knock off the Tea Party shutdown that is closing and fracturing our government. I hope that it's a wake-up call to them, the response of the American people to this. As one faction of one party in one House of Congress, in one branch of our separated powers of government, they don't get to have everything their way. That is not the way the Constitution was structured. And that's particularly true when the public doesn't agree with them. And the public doesn't agree with them. They just lost an election on this exact issue. But we're going to have other disagreements. And if we just roll through this one and then bang right up against the next hostage scenario, very likely on the debt limit, which if we blow that and go into default, will be even more catastrophic than the accumulating economic harm of a government shutdown. If we keep going into one hostage scenario after another, then we won't have solved the real problem. We cannot work like responsible adults when a minority, a faction of one party in one house in one branch of government, is having the procedural equivalent of a tantrum. And true as science and real as Mother Nature, we have the problem of carbon pollution bearing down upon us. Will the polluters prevent action on that? Will we fail to do our duty as representatives of the American people? Will we be unable to face and address this real problem because we're opposed by false and fanciful arguments with the strings pulled by special interests instead of us looking plainly at the problem coming to for a reasonable solution. So this has been a different day than my usual time to wake up speech because you know what?
It is time to wake up to the problems of carbon pollution and climate change. It's also time to wake up to the peculiar way that special and narrow interests are able to tie this body in knots and do damage to the American public for their own benefit. And that larger problem is something that we're going to have to reconcile ourselves with. And um, if we just look at this as one problem, the Tea Party shutdown, and we get through it, we'll simply go on to another unless we've decided that our Constitution matters for something, that the structure of government that the Founding Fathers put together gave us a procedure to work out our differences, and that we should follow that constitutional procedure even when we have strong feelings about something. That is the legacy of the men and women who founded this country. It is the legacy that men and women have fought and bled and died for. And it besmirches that legacy to have a tiny faction of one party in one house in one branch of government break the whole mechanism just because they want everything their own way. I yield the floor. Senator from Ohio. Thank you. I think the Senator from Rhode Island had it exactly right, calling this a Tea Party shutdown. It's, it's, it's unnecessary. It inflicts pain on far too many Rhode Islanders, people from Massachusetts and, and Ohioans, and um, it's, it's, it's all so needless, and it's so simple, open up the government. I mean, I think that Speaker Boehner needs to um, make a decision. Does he want to be Speaker of the far right wing of the Republican Party, or does he want to be Speaker of the United States House of Representatives? If he chooses to do the latter, um, it means putting the resolution, putting what's called the continuing resolution to, open the, to reopen the government, putting it on the floor in the House of Representatives down the hall, allowing all 430 some, I think there are a couple of vacancies, 430 some members of the House to vote, members of both parties, all duly elected in November, all sworn in on January 3rd of this year to allow them to vote. If they, if they vote on this, I'm pretty confident that Democrats and Republicans together will reach a strong majority. That legislation will then be sent to the White House. The President will sign it. The government shutdown ends. This is irresponsible not to simply let the House of Representatives vote. One, um, the President said the other day that, or maybe yesterday, it might have been earlier today, I'm not sure, said one faction of one party, of one house, of one branch of government shut down the government. One faction of one party, of one house, of one branch of government uh, simply shut down this government. And, you know, this, this whole lurching from one crisis to another by, by design, by, by sort of a manufactured crisis that we've seen over and over and over again is, is something that, that simply doesn't work for the American people. Let me talk about a couple of sort of personal things, personal stories in Ohio. Um, I come to the Senate floor from time to time and, and read letters from constituents. And I, I won't read letters today because the senator from Arkansas, I think, is going to be speaking perhaps in a moment. But I do want to just tell, tell a few quick stories. And, uh, a number of, of working Ohioans, from the small business owner in Lima and western Ohio waiting for a loan to a farmer in Chillicothe in southern Ohio looking for help from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, to employees at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, employees on the base and contractors outside the base are all affected by this. 91 World War II veterans stopped off an honor flight in Washington, D.C. today to visit their yesterday to visit the World War II memorial, their memorial. Many of those veterans, I've been to those honor memorial, honor flights when they visit, uh, they, they visit Arlington and they visit the World War II memorial, which is a pretty new memorial on the mall. Many of those soldiers and sailors and airmen men and women that have come from, from my state, I know many of them had never been to Washington before. This was their first trip. They're often in their 80s. Well, those 91 World War II veterans, many in wheelchairs, many with walkers, came anyway, even though they heard the place was shut down. They weren't letting a government shutdown prevent them from paying their respects to their brothers and sisters who had died during World War II or fought in that war and have died since. They persevered just as they had fighting in World War II. These organizations 
give back to the men and women who gave so much to our country. But while these 90 World War II veterans prevailed, even though the, the memorial was, was shut down, they pretty much forced their way in with help from a number of others. Too many Ohioans will be hurt by this prolonged shutdown. Let me talk about a few real quickly. Sharon Purdy of Spencerville, Ohio, wrote to me concerned about the status of this weekend's National Firefighters Memorial Service held each year in suburban Maryland. Her husband, Lee, was killed in the line of duty in the year 2000 and was memorialized there 12 years ago. Sharon goes back every year to pay her respects. Two Ohio firefighters killed in the line of duty will be honored this year. Michael Bergen from the Sugar Creek Fire Department and Rocky Duncan from the Niles Township Fire Department, Sugar Creek and Tuscarawas County and East Central Ohio and in Niles and Northeast Ohio and Trumbull County. Thousands of firefighters and their families will be coming from across the country to pay their respects, but presumably the gates will be closed. That's how government's repaying them for their sacrifice, because some people want to score political points instead of doing their job and irresponsibly shutting down the government. The so-called Tea Party, the so-called Tea Party shutdown. I received a letter today from Judith Cowan, the president of the Ohio Energy and Advanced Manufacturing Center. She's building a state-of-the-art manufacturing center in Lima, investing in new electromagnetic forming technology. She's been partnering with EDA, the Economic Development Administration, to build the center. But you know what? She received a notice today that her reimbursement check from EDA is what? It's on hold due to the shutdown. EDA is not allowed under the law to do that because they can't pay these bills. They must stop because of this irresponsible Tea Party shutdown of the government. Her project is in mid-construction. Supplies have been purchased. Concrete's been poured. Workers' time has been set aside. She told my office she makes an effort to hire local contractors and use small businesses in her supply chain, if you will. She's concerned that these small businesses live paycheck to paycheck depend on her. Think of the people that, that poured the concrete. Think of the small companies that, that, that did the iron work. Think of the other companies that have, have sold to her for this, this EDA help finance project and you realize that some of these small businesses are going to face very hard times again because of this hard-headed far-right uh, Tea Party shutdown which was simply unnecessary. Contrary to the political games that the far right in the House, the radicals are playing, this isn't a game. These are real people facing a real and devastating impact. They don't deserve to be punished for the political ideology of a few. Remember, one faction of one political party in one house in one branch of government has held hostage the whole rest of the government. And these the millions of people affected by them. This is not about whether we will or won't agree to go to conference on a budget. This is about whether Congress in this country can continue to govern. Senate Democrats have compromised on the funding levels. According to reports, the Senate passed resolution comes at a level 18 percent below what the President proposed five years ago. It's 17 percent below what the Democratic Congress proposed four years ago. It's 10 percent below what Republicans proposed three years ago and 8 percent below the debt ceiling of two years ago. So this isn't about spending. This isn't about fiscal issues. This is about attaching one party's, in this case the Republican, one party's political platform, presumably out of the 2012 Republican Convention, attaching one party's political platform to simple legislation to make the government work, to keep the government going. It's, it's a waiting game that they're willing to play that the American people are not, not willing to play. For some, it's okay to hurt a thousand small businesses as the SBA loan program is furloughed. For some, it's okay to put 50,000 Ohio federal employees and hundreds of thousands more around the country out of work. For some, it's okay to deny senior citizens in Mansfield or in, in, in Ravenna or in Youngstown new Social Security benefit. It's not okay with me. It's not okay with most of the members of the United States Senate, and it surely is not okay with the American people. It's time to stop those political games. It's time to put the American people first. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I yield the floor. Senator from Arkansas. Madam President, today uh, I want to rise to say that I'm 
have some disappointment and frustration, and that is what's causing me to speak today because this is a day that I've worked very hard to prevent. I think many in this chamber, really on both sides of the aisle, but particularly on this side of the aisle, have worked very hard to prevent this day from happening. Our government has shut down, and it hurts our economy just when we're turning the corner, and this is something I think that uh, the economists are worried about when you talk to our colleagues, uh, not just in this chamber, but really around the country. You know, when you talk to governors and talk to state legislators and uh, business people, just people we know really from all around the country, they're so disappointed that it's gotten to this point. And I think most people express what I, I felt about 10 days ago when I was in Arkansas. I was at a big dinner to raise money for cancer research there at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. By the way, they raised about a million dollars that night. It was a great evening. Uh, honored my parents, which was really nice. But nonetheless, when we were there, I bet I had a dozen people come up to me and say, what is wrong with the house? Have these people lost their minds? What are they doing over there? This is back about 10 days ago when they would voted the way they voted recently on the farm bill. And also, that was a Thursday, and also on the Friday, they took that step that was leading to where we are today on shutting down the government. And what I tell the folks in Arkansas is, look, um, hyper-partisanship has taken over here. This is one of those situations where um, if you look at the track record of the Senate, I know it's not true in every single case, but you look at the track record of the Senate, in our chamber we try to work in a bipartisan way. Uh, because of the nature of the rules, because of the size of the body, because of their traditions, quite honestly, because of the Constitution, because of our DNA, we tend, we tend to work together in this body. And that has been uh, a key to the Senate for years and years and years. And what it's led to in this particular case is we have passed four, what I would think of as very responsible measures to t keep the government open. These are four responsible measures that we voted on, fair and square, came here to the floor, we had votes. They weren't all 100 to nothing, but nonetheless, people are working together to try to get this resolved. And you go down the hall here to the House, and what you see down there is my way or the highway politics. And ladies and gentlemen, fellow Americans, you know it's true, those are dead-end politics. That's leading us nowhere. That's what, that's what got us here. And we have to look back and think about where we've been in the last few years. Think about how bad things were in the Great Recession. Think about the progress we've made since then. Look at our housing market. It is so much better today than it was five years ago. Uh, consumer confidence is back where it, you know, headed in the right direction. It's good. It's getting stronger all the time. You look at uh, sales of trucks and cars in this country. that They've reached their fastest pace since November of 07, you know, before the crash. And the private sector jobs, they're just, they just continue month after month to add those jobs all around the country. And those are good things. Why in the world does the House want to put this all in jeopardy. Well, Madam President, I must tell you, I've been concerned because in the last few days I've had reporters who kind of stalk us out here in the hallways uh, on our way in and out of the Capitol and when we're voting, etc. And I've had more than one stop me and say, you realize that when we go down and cover the House, they talk about red state Democrats. They talk about your race in Arkansas. Madam President, let me just say it's going to be a very sad day in this country when we learn that this is all about politics. I hope, I sincerely hope it's not all about politics. I hope that we do not have people down in the other chamber who are, have elevated politics above what's best, what's right for our country. But when I hear those questions from reporters, there certainly are people down there that are talking a lot about politics when this nation is in crisis. I think we should all be concerned about that. I think we should make sure that that is not the case. If they have a legitimate philosophical issue, that's one thing. But if this is all about politics, if, this, if these 
irresponsible set of votes to shut down the government is all about politics and shame on them. Because when you look at the impact this is going to have, the Social Security Administration will be forced to reduce staff. And that causes delays for our seniors as they file for benefits and as they apply for replacement Social Security cards. The progress we've made at the VA, you know, I've been very involved in trying to cut back the VA backlog of claims. Well, that progress we've made there is going to stop. It's going to force our vets to wait even longer to get the benefits that they've earned. Uh, when you look at small businesses with the, uh, the, the uh, shutting down of the Small Business Administration, we're going to have hundreds and hundreds of small businesses that are going to lose their access to capital just in the next few days. Uh, the national parks, wildlife refuges, rec recreational areas. You know, that's not just a terrible thing for American families who want to take their children out and want to take their families out to explore and ex experience the, the great outdoors here in America and some of the raw beauty that America has to offer, but it's also bad for business. We have a lot of businesses in my state. We have a lot of businesses around the country that are around these areas that they thrive on things like, you know, canoe rentals and all kinds of things, camping equipment, et cetera. Uh, you know, it could be bicycling, it could be hiking boots, whatever it is, but these businesses depend on that type of activity. They depend on those facilities being open and they depend on Americans having the ability to go out and do and see and experience the great things in this country. Madam President, I'm also chairman of the subcommittee on agriculture appropriations. And let me tell you, I know firsthand the devastating impact that this shutdown will have on our agriculture industry. It's going to have negative ripple effects all around the nation's economy. Now, you know one thing that I've learned the hard way here in Washington in the last 10 or 11 years is there are a lot of people here inside the Beltway that don't understand agriculture, they don't get excited about agriculture, they don't, they don't care about agriculture, sometimes they just sort of take it for granted. But the truth is, agriculture is one of the core strengths in the U.S. economy. It's something that we do better than everyone else in the world. Everyone in the world wants to be like us. It's something we can be proud of. It adds a lot to the nation's economy. It's also great for our trade. If you just take my one state of Arkansas, it's our largest industry. It supports one in six jobs in my state. It also creates about $17 billion of economic activity. And overall, when you look at the state's economy, it's about 25% of Arkansas's economy. And that's going to be true. Maybe those numbers not exactly the same, but that kind of ratio, those kind of numbers are going to be true in every state in the union. I know Senator Stabenow is chair of the Senate Agriculture Committee. She talks about how Michigan, everybody thinks of Michigan as heavy industry, the auto industry, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and all that's true, but Michigan's second largest industry is agriculture. It's just like you go to a state like Massachusetts. The, the mix of agriculture products in a state like Massachusetts is going to be very different than what we have in the state of Arkansas but it allows Massachusetts to utilize its natural advantages, its natural resources. So things like specialty crops are going to be very important up there. And we have some of that in our state, but every state is going to have a different mix and it's important that every state be very strong in agriculture. Some, you know, one of the newer things in agriculture, which is uh, good, is things like organic farming, things like that. Certainly, uh, that is part of the future and that's something that the Farm Bill and the, that the Senate has is something we want to see get done. We don't want to see that brought to a halt. We don't want to see that hampered in any way. We don't want to see our food supply and our fiber supply jeopardized by ranked politics down the hall in the House of Representatives. The U.S. House has already created turmoil in this vital industry by shutting down the government. But to complicate matters, They've also taken another very irresponsible set of actions in the last few weeks. And that is they've allowed, because of their own problems down the hall, they've allowed the 2008 Farm Bill to expire. 
Madam President, last night at midnight, we went from the 2008 Farm Bill to the 1949 law. We're currently, the United States of America is currently under the 1949 agriculture law. The problem is there's no solution in sight. Now, God bless Debbie Stabenow. Senator Stabenow has been an amazing champion for agriculture. Again, I mentioned her. You know, agriculture is the second largest industry in Michigan, but she has worked so hard in the last couple of years to try to get this chamber to do right on agriculture, and it has. Last year we passed a farm bill, went down the hall and died. This year we passed a farm bill, went down the hall, they blew it up. So here we see us working in a bipartisan way. By the way, that farm bill here in the Senate got something like 66 votes. Again, good, solid, bipartisan vote. But you see the House members, they continue to wreak havoc with this economic powerhouse. So right now, think about agriculture. Again, one of the core strengths, one of the pillars of the U.S. economy. You see it facing a double whammy. They've got the slowdown, and now they have the expiration, the expiration of the 19, uh, excuse me, 2008 Farm Bill. So what does that really mean? Well, if you're a farmer, you'll know what this means. The Farm Service Agency, Rural Development, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, the county offices will all be closing. We had farmers today call us and say, can I get this payment? Can I make this happen? Can I apply for something? A lot of times the answer to that is going to be no, because those offices will be closed. When they need help, there's not going to be anyone there to help them. So uh, when they go there, basically they're just going to knock on the door and it's going to be locked up and they're going to be closed for business. So this means that new USDA loans and grants are being stopped. This means that the cutting edge agriculture research that America is famous for is going to stop. It also means that when it comes to food inspection and those workers, that is going to be in jeopardy as well. And that's something that we fought very hard on. I thought I was allied with many of my Republican colleagues on that. But the worst part about this, and maybe the saddest part about this, it, it was all so preventable. We can still prevent it from happening. We can do something today to make this go away. But nonetheless, here again, the House refuses to compromise. This my way or the highway attitude, well, like I said before, leading us to a dead end. Madam President, about two weeks ago, <clears throat> we were fortunate enough, several of us, to listen to Tom Carper come and speak to us about uh, some things that were on his mind. Bipartisan group, about 15 or 20 of us in there. And Tom singled out one of our great colleagues, Mike Enzi. And Mike Enzi has been a stalwart conservative Republican, just a rock rib Republican. But he's someone that we all know and trust and respect. And he talked about when Mike Enzi and uh, Ted Kennedy were paired up as chair and ranking member of the HELP Committee here in the Senate, that's a very unlikely pair. I mean, they don't get any different than that really in philosophy or personality or regions of the state or background or anything like that. But nonetheless, those two senators, they adopted what they call the 80-20 rule. They know they don't agree on everything, but let's, they said, look, let's find the 80% of the things that we can agree on and let's work on those and let's get them done. And that's what they try to do. A great example of bipartisanship, Senator Kennedy, as liberal as he was, he was a great liberal lion, everybody knows that, very, very staunch in his, in his views and very serious about how he took those views, but he also was very much willing to reach across the aisle. And that 80-20 rule is what's missing down the hallway here. We still have it in the Senate to some extent, not as much as we used to. We need to make sure that we reestablish this and we find areas of common ground where we can agree and work with each other in every single uh, situation that we possibly can. But down the hall, it's gone. That's the problem right now in Washington, is you have a lot of people uh, in the Congress, some in the Senate as well, but in the House and Senate generally, you have way too many people that they say, I want 100% or nothing. 
And if I can't have 100%, then you get nothing. And they'll do everything they can to stop it, and that's exactly what's happened. That's why we have this crisis today. It's completely manufactured by the U.S. House of Representatives. You know, Madam President, I feel like I'm elected by my people to make the hard decisions, to come up here and do what's best for the country, to do what's right, to use my best judgment, and all of these are judgment calls and they're tough calls, and I've always tried to do that, but that's what governing's about. That's what governing's about. It's about making those tough calls and showing some leadership. So tonight, Madam President, I urge, I urge our colleagues in the House, all 435 of them, to stop the hyperpartisanship, especially those on the Republican side of the aisle who just can't seem to say yes when it comes to a bipartisan solution. I urge them to stop the hyperpartisanship and to work with the Senate to reopen our government. And I know, and you all know, that I'll be working very hard to find a responsible agreement, and I sincerely hope that we have a sufficient number in the House that will join me in that, and let's get this done. Madam President, with that, I will yield the floor and suggest the absence of a quorum.